Galadriel is one of the most iconic characters in the Lord of the Rings. I would even say in the fantasy genre in general. An elven woman, powerful and wise, timeless, older than sun and moon. She is one of the great powers in Middle-earth that oppose evil in the form of Sauron. But what is her story? And here things become very complicated. Which Galadriel do you mean? The mother of Amros, the daughter of Felagund and sister of Gil-galad. The Galadriel who sailed from the west continent Aman to Middle-earth with her husband Teleporno, a Teler elf. Or the one who walked to Middle-earth over Helcaraxe with the other elves led by Fingolfin and met her husband Kiliborn, Cinder elf in Dorias or the Galadriel who is one of the founders of Eregion, or the one who is not even mentioned in context of Eregion. You see the problem, it's a complex topic and many versions of Galadriel exist. Galadriel from the perspective of Tolkien's writings is a relatively new character, which might be surprising for some people. Tolkien invented her when he wrote the Lothlorien chapters for the Lord of the Rings around 1941. For example Elrond is a much older character in contrast from the perspective of Tolkien writing his stories, though inside the world he is much younger. His law was written by Tolkien long ago and only got few changes over time. Of course there were always multiple versions of events and characters in Tolkien's writing process but Galadriel probably takes the cake. Tolkien spent a lot of time and energy trying to fit her into his existing writings. It might be surprising but he started writing his mythology first and iterated it further and further. He started as early as 1916. For comparison the first edition of The Hobbit was published 1937 and he started writing it in the early 30s. Let's not talk about The Lord of the Rings which was mostly completed 1949. As a result some ideas of The Lord of the Rings like the One Ring did not even exist in the original Hobbit release where the ring Bilbo found was just some magic ring. And of course this was also the case for his even older mythology. And because of that some characters and events we know predate even The Hobbit by far. That was for example the case for Elrond and his basic law but not for Galadriel. Interestingly Elrond's background story didn't change much except for one big detail. Over time he was developed from a ruler in Middle Earth to advisor of Amros to the first king of Númenor while only with the Hobbit he finally became the Lord of Rivendell. Tolkien invented a twin brother for Elrond named Elros who took over his role as first king of Númenor to keep the law implications of the line of the half elven intact. His earliest mention I could find was from about 1926. We find it in the book The Shaping of Middle Earth. So 11 years before the first edition of The Hobbit was even released. Which just shows what an early character he is. Galadriel as mentioned was first mentioned around 1941 in comparison. As a result the Lord of Rivendell is well woven into the law and his ancestors are of exceptional significance. He naturally grew with the development of Tolkien's law. However this is very different for Galadriel. We looked deep into Elrond and his law in my Who is Elrond video which consists of multiple parts. Feel free to check out those if you are interested and maybe bring some time with you. If we now return to Galadriel we also find as expected multiple versions of her. But there is one difference. In contrast she did not grow naturally with the law foundation of Tolkien's world due to her being invented much later. Tolkien really tried a lot to implement her into the law and give her a significance fitting to her character but whatever he tried her character would never fully fit perfectly. As a result there are a lot of versions of her and I mean a lot. And on top of that most of them contradict each other because Tolkien experimented quite a bit. What is even worse is that Tolkien sadly never completed the process of weaving her into the law. 
And that is the reason why I called this video the impossible law video because the unfortunate truth is that it is in fact impossible to form a consistent version of a law from the time span of her early life in the first age to around third age 1981. For comparison Frodo leaves the Shire third age 3018. There are only very few points we know for sure and with at least over 6000 years that is a ridiculously long time of uncertainty on what Galadriel actually did. Especially the second age is an absolute mess which is of course relevant for the Amazon show The Rings of Power and maybe allows them to take some liberties or choose some details from versions they like. However, everyone who tells you a seemingly consistent version of a background story and law including the second age is telling you either the headcanon, their own interpretation, fanfiction or are simplifying this law problem significantly, maybe even ignoring it. Don't get me wrong, there's no problem having a headcanon especially in this case but I think people should at least know that they are listening to an interpretation of what is actually written. And that interpretation is then also not wrong but it's still an interpretation. In this video I try to give you an overview of some of those versions. I want to tell you what we definitely know about Galadriel and at least try to explain why Tolkien had so much trouble adding her to the law. I can already spoil this video won't be covering everything else I would make another 8 hour video. Maybe a future project. I will also split it in several parts. Before we now start to go chronologically through Galadriel's law a few hints as always. I'm Chris aka The Philosopher's Games and for my law videos I try to pronounce the names as Tolkien described it. This includes the trilled R. Shoutouts to the artists who allowed me to use their fantastic artworks like Kimberly 80, Ted Naismith, Sara Morello, Jenny Dolphin and all the others. Also spoiler warning. We begin with the early first age mostly from the published Silmarillion's perspective. Always keep in mind when some of these ideas were first written Galadriel did not exist for in some cases more than a decade. Also later when The Lord of the Rings was written and even after it was published Tolkien reworked some of the lore again to make things fit. In this time some of the new characters were added to the lore like Galadriel, Gil-galad and Celebrimbor. Covering the first age also called the elder days is always very complicated. For example dates and the measurement of time. In the book The War of the Jewels from 1994 which published notes and draft texts of Tolkien related to the Silmarillion that is the law of the Lord of the Rings the book we learn that the first age starts with the creation or awakening of the first elves. As a result the biggest part of the first age belongs to a time span called years of the trees that was before sun and moon existed in Tolkien's mythology. As said there are different versions it's a complicated topic. With the creation of sun and moon 590 years before the first age will end we now have the years of the sun and noting things in solar years became a thing. During the years of the trees dates are usually not noted in solar years but in valiant years and for the conversion factor Tolkien wrote different versions. And as you can imagine things get a bit complicated this way. For example saying how old Galadriel is when Frodo meets her in the Lord of the Rings is not easy because of that. But if we select the fitting factor Tolkien most likely had in mind when he wrote down her known birth year she should be a around 8372 years old. So according to the War of the Jewels she was born years of the trees 1362 as daughter of the Noldor Finarfin and his wife Earwen a tailor. The Noldor and Teleri are two of the three big elven clans. Finarfin is the youngest son of the king of the Noldor and Earwen is the daughter of the king of the Teleri in Aman. Galadriel also had several older brothers Finrod, Angrod and Aignor and just these basic information already need a lot of explanation but we will need it as a foundation. 
Let's start with the time. What is the first age? There are several ages in Tolkien's world. Lord of the Rings plays in the third age, Rings of Power in the second and Galadriel was born in the first age. As mentioned, the first one starts with the creation of the elves, which followed the plan of Eru, that is the one god of Tolkien's world. The elves awoke in Middle-earth, the continent in the middle of the world, called Arda. At this time in Tolkien's mythology, sun and moon did not exist exist. Only the stars at the sky and two big glowing trees existed as light source of the world. As said, this is a complicated topic and there is more to it, plus some inconsistencies in some poems, but that we will ignore here. The two big glowing trees were on the west continent Aman, where most of the spirit beings, the Ainur, lived, at least the good ones. Eru once gave them the choice to go to the world and form it, but as a result they would be bound to it. I usually compare those very powerful spirit beings to angels. The most powerful of them were called the Valar, the powers, who formed something like a god pantheon. Besides those there were many others of lesser rank and power, the Maiar. Those were still often extremely powerful and served the Valar. If you have seen the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf, Saruman and Radagast are Maiar in disguise of old men. Further, there exist some special cases as well which might not fit into the scheme, like Shelob's mother Ungoliant or Tom Bombadil. One of the Valar called Melkor, or later Morgos, was evil and decided to oppose the plans of Eru and undo the creation of the others. As a result, he was kicked out of the group of Valar. Some Maiar also followed his path, for example Sauron, but also others who would become the Balrogs and probably even more in other roles. And as you can imagine, by just hearing those names, they caused a lot of trouble, even before the elves were around, especially if you consider that Melkor was the most powerful of them all. When the elves awoke in Middle-earth, which was where Melkor, the first Dark Lord, resided, they were out of reach of the Valar and Melkor started to influence them unhindered. To protect them, the Valar decided to attack Melkor for the sake of the elves and end his evil, in which they succeeded, resulting in Melkor being captured and imprisoned for three valiant ages. Let's assume that are 3000 years. They then invited the elves to Aman to dwell there free from evil and close to the blessed light of the two trees. To be precise, first three ambassadors were invited to the west continent and then, when they reported back, the elves could decide and most decided to accept the invitation. The journey to Aman was called the Great Journey and the elves also split into the three elven clans, the Vanyar, the Noldor and the Teleri. The Teleri on this journey split into multiple sub-clans. The biggest were probably the Sindar elves, but there were also the Nandor elves. Those sub-clans did not complete the Great Journey and never came to Aman until they eventually sailed west in the far future. The others completed the journey and now lived in the light of the west continent. The king of the Noldor was Finwë. The king of the Teleri was once Elwë, but he stayed in Middle-earth and became king and founder of the clan of the Sindar there. His brother Olwë became king of the Teleri in Aman. The king of the Vanyar was Ingwe and he was also king of all elves. Those three kings were once also the mentioned three ambassadors. Galadriel's father Finarfin is the youngest son of Finwë, the king of the Noldor. Galadriel's mother Earwen is the daughter of Olwë, king of the Teleri in Aman. So Galadriel is from the royal line of the Noldor and Teleri. And it gets even more complicated because Finwë's first wife died after she gave birth to their first son and heir Feanor. After her death Finwë was allowed by the Valar to marry again and he married an elven woman that is depending on the version either the niece of King Ingwe or his daughter. With her Finwë had multiple children, one of them was Finarfin, the father of Galadriel. Finarfin also had an older brother named Fingolfin and an even older half-brother, the mentioned Feanor. I know a lot of names, but it's important. 
So now we have the basic outline of the early first age. Melkor was imprisoned. The elves of Aman are safe, they have children and live in peace. The elves that remained in Middle Earth were the Sindar and Nandor who ended the great journey early and for completeness sake there were also the Avari who refused to even start the great journey. In this time of peace Galadriel was born as youngest child of Finarfin and Earwin. She is related to the kings of the original three elven clans. The Vanyar elves were known for their golden hair, the Noldor usually for their dark hair and the Teleri often had silver hair. Finarfin inherited the golden hair of his mother who was a Vanya and also his children inherited it. As a result his house is sometimes called the golden house of Finarfin. However Galadriel's hair is even more special as Tolkien describes it in letter 348. Galadriel had long hair which glistened like gold but was also shot with silver. So she had a bit of the silver hair of her mother as well. If we now think of the two trees of Valinor, one was golden and one was silver and further it was believed that her hair absorbed the light of the trees which made it so special. Her Sindarin name Galadriel which she got later consists of Galad meaning light radiance and Ri crown garland while El or Iel is a suffix for a female. Tolkien gives several translations but I like this one, maiden crowned with a garland of bright radiance. There are other names we come to in a moment. But let us return to her family for a moment. So her father was Finarfin, her mother Earwin and her older brothers were Finrod, Angrod and Aignor. Now here we already have some interesting details in Tolkien's writing history. John Ronald Rule Tolkien never completed his version of the Silmarillion and the Silmarillion we know which was published posthumously by his son Christopher is composed out of versions of the texts that fit best to the second edition of the Lord of the Rings from 1965. As a result canon is a very complicated topic as you can imagine. For example why take text A when text B is the newer one. Tolkien moved names back and forth all the time and changed details often, sometimes creating new problems in his very complex web of history and lore for his world. To give you an example regarding Galadriel's father and oldest brother. In the first edition of the Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King published in 1955 we can read in appendix F, the Lady Galadriel of the royal house of Finrod, father of Felagund, lord of Nargosrond. And yes it was once published like this. Here her father is still called Finrod and her brother is called Inglor and later Inglor Felagund. In the second edition this was changed already and all other references in the book to the golden house of Finarfin as well. To the Lady Galadriel of the royal house of Finarfir and sister of Finrod Felagund, king of Nargosrond. And according to the Lord of the Rings, a reader's companion, it only changed in 1978 in the ninth printing by Christopher Tolkien to what we mostly know today, the Lady Galadriel of the royal house of Finarfin and sister of Finrod Felagund, king of Nargosrond. Interestingly all of them mean exactly the same persons, only the names were changed and because Tolkien initially changed it himself this case is pretty much closed. However it should be mentioned that there exist many iterations of Galadriel's family tree, not only changing names but also persons. In an early version of the tale of years, so appendix B, we can read for Celeborn had to wife the Lady Galadriel of the Noldor, sister of Gilgalad. So there was a time where Tolkien even had in mind to make Gilgalad her brother and guess who their father was, quote from peoples of Middle Earth. For she was the daughter of Felagund the Fair and the elder sister of Gilgalad, though seldom had they met for ere Nargosrond was made or Felagund was driven from Dorthonion, she passed east over the mountains and forsook Beleriand and first of all the Noldor came to the inner lands and too late she heard the summons of Fionwë. 
Here not only some names were switched around, but the person switched. However, Tolkien seems to have decided on the names later and her being the sister of Finrod Felagund and daughter of Finarfin. This is in my opinion the most canon version, but this simple example shows Tolkien's working process of adding characters to the lore. As mentioned, Gilgalad is also a new character, while Finrod Felagund and Finarfin are much older. Fascinatingly, Gilgalad's parentage is almost an unsolved problem in the lore. Tolkien could not find a good place for him, so he became in the latest version the grandson of Galadriel's brother Angrod. One could ask, why would Tolkien not simply give Galadriel just another brother with Gil-galad? The answer is, in my opinion, because Tolkien simply did not want to rewrite all of his first age lore again, adding mentions of characters to all of it. So Tolkien searched for solutions to add new characters, which should be important, into families of great significance in the lore without having to rewrite everything. Because if he does not, one might ask, when this character becomes so important later, why is he nowhere mentioned in the first age? What was he doing all the time in all the battles? Well, you see the problem of adding important new characters to already written stories. In a way, it's a problem that results directly from elves being immortal. These characters must have been around in the past for a long time. We also will later see what the solution for adding Galadriel to the lore was. So let us move on in the story of the early and peaceful first age. Galadriel was a very tall elven maiden, strong of body and will, but also beautiful. Tolkien intensified this idea further while he wrote more and more versions. Later in letter 348 from 1973, which is the year of Tolkien's death, he wrote, Galadriel is a secondary name given to her in her youth in the far past because she had long hair which glistened like gold but was also shot with silver. She was then of Amazon disposition and bound up her hair as a crown when taking part in athletic feats. In the Unfinished Tales we find a version probably written around 1967. Galadriel was the greatest of the Noldor, except Feanor may be, though she was wiser than he, and her wisdom increased with the long years. Her mother name was Nerwen, man-maiden, and she grew to be tall beyond the measure even of the women of the Noldor. She was strong of body, mind and will, a match for both the lawmasters and the athletes of the Eldar in the days of their youth. To be fair, being wiser than Feanor is not that difficult. However, this is a pretty big statement for a completely new character, but Tolkien tried to give an explanation for her significance and wisdom in the Third Age. Keep in mind, when Tolkien started writing about Feanor, Galadriel did not exist. Speaking of, Galadriel's uncle Feanor, heir of King Finwë, half-brother of Finarfin, is considered the most powerful elven craftsman in history. When elven females are pregnant, parts of the mother's spirit, for lack of a better wording on my part, goes into the child. This was so extreme in the case of Feanor's mother that she was absolutely exhausted, almost empty afterwards. So she lay down at some point and her spirit left her body to remain in the halls of Mandos, the place where the spirits or souls of the dead go. Well, her body was perfectly fine and was preserved by the angels, if I remember correctly. Elves can even get a new body and be re-embodied in Amman after they died, but she would not want to come out of the halls. This explains why Feanor's spirit was so powerful and Tolkien also wrote very complex essays of this particular topic to explore this metaphysical aspect of his world more. You find them in the book Morgoth's Ring. There are also multiple versions. Feanor was for sure powerful in combat as well, but he is more known for things he created. For example, at least eight Palantiri, 
He invented the elven writing system Tengwar, which in a specific mode we also see on the One Ring, and at some point he started experimenting with trapping the light of the two trees into objects to make powerful artifacts. Tolkien had the idea that an inspiration for this research was Galadriel's hair. At least that is what the elves believed and in my opinion it fits into the mythological lore very well. In one version he even asked Galadriel three times for a hair of hers, but she refused every time. This idea did not make it into the published Silmarillion though, but because Tolkien never finished the Silmarillion himself, canon can always be debated. There is no clear answer if that actually happened or not. We only know Tolkien wrote this idea down at some point and his son Christopher luckily published pretty much everything after the death of his father. For why Galadriel refused to give Feanor some of her hairs we can read These two kinsfolk, the greatest of the Eldar of Valinor, were unfriends forever. Usually we only know the nice elves from the Lord of the Rings who are wise and help out others they don't even know, very generous and kind. Feanor was not like that. He was proud, stubborn and did not care much for others outside his direct family. It was probably hard to get along with him and he did many cruel and unwise things, to the point I would call him a madman. Still, he ended up creating his magnum opus, three extremely powerful gems called the Silmarils or in the Quenya plural the Silmarili, which had the light of the two trees of Valinor trapped inside them. They were also later blessed by the Vala Varda, one of the high angels and queen of the stars, revered by the elves. Quote, and Varda hallowed the Silmarils so that thereafter no mortal flesh nor hands unclean nor anything of evil will might touch them, but it was scorched and withered. And Mandos foretold that the fates of Arda, earth, sea and air lay locked within them. The mortal flesh part seems a bit exaggerated because we in fact know two, technically even maybe three or four very worthy mortals touching them without any problems. In addition mortal men did not exist at the time of the creation of the Silmarili, so maybe it refers to other mortal beings. I guess the source itself might be questionable as well, but they definitely burned evil and all looked upon them in wonder. The title Silmarillion translates to of the Silmarils, so it becomes clear how important those will be for the law and their fate is tied to so many things. In the next section the time of peace will suddenly come to an end and then things become interesting but also far less clear law wise when it comes to Galadriel because now we are still on the west continent and Galadriel is later in Middle Earth so how does she get there? We discuss this in the next part. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. As said, this is part 1, there will be more. I decided to start this law video project about Galadriel a bit earlier for obvious reasons. It's on my mind for quite some time now. Next I try to complete the Who is Elrond video though. I might even publish the next part of this video here in between as well, I don't know yet. It depends on how much time I spent on covering the Rings of Power show. It's a bit unfortunate that I had to stop here. It really gets interesting now, but we will continue when I have time. If you liked this video, please consider pressing the like button, leave a comment, recommend me to other people interested in Tolkien or maybe even subscribe and press the annoying bell. If you still look for more in-depth lore videos, check my channel. The mentioned who is Elrond video split into several parts might be interesting. I also link playlists with my best videos in the description. Next on my channel a set with Elrond, rings of power coverage and analysis, many streams, watch parties, maybe I can organize a round table with other YouTube people as well. 
We will see. I try to cover the show a bit on the German Law channel as well. If you still had not enough, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, maybe check my Discord. I also play video games at times on my Twitch channel and I also have a gaming related YouTube channel as well. So a ton of content is available. You find the links in the description. Shoutouts to the artists and all people supporting this channel. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.